to properly compare simplicial complexes, we need a way of sending the data of one simplicial complex into another. And that's the focus of this lecture. So let K and L be simplicial complexes. The main definition is the notion of a simplicial map. So a simplicial map, let's call it f, that's always a good name for a function, from k to l is an assignment uh, from k0 to l0. So remember, these are vertices of k, those are vertices of L. And an assignment is just a map. Every vertex K0 uh, goes in, and then a vertex of L0 comes out. Um, it's typical to just write F for both these things, because um, the vertex information will end up determining what happens to every simplex. Um, so it's an assignment so that for every simplex, sigma, so let's give it a list of vertices, v0 all the way up to vk, the image, let's call it f of sigma, and of course that's going to be the map f that has uh, contains a recipe for sending vertices of k to vertices of l, so you just apply that to everything that you see, all the vertices of sigma. Now I'm writing this as a set, but Right now, there's no reason that two of these couldn't be equal or all of these couldn't be equal. So in general, um, you might see repeat vertices, in which case you just cancel the repeat. It's a set, so every vertex can appear only once. It might have strictly fewer than k plus 1 elements because f need not be injective. Um, so this image is a simplex in L. So this is sort of the obvious thing that you would think of. You uh, every simplex is a list of vertices. You have a procedure for sending vertices to vertices, so you can send every simplex to its image. Um, it's good to see examples as quickly as possible, so let's do that. Um, the first one is the inclusion of a subcomplex. So if k is a subcomplex of L, then you write the inclusion map with this sort of harpoony hooked arrow. Um, so it just sends every vertex of k to that same vertex in L. Remember that the vertices of L include the vertices of k. Uh, every simplex of k ends up being a simplex of L, and that's what this map does. It sends the simplex uh, in k to its copy um, in L. Um, and uh, and if you want to see it more sort of uh, concretely, so here is 0, 1, 2. This is the hollow uh, 2 simplex. Uh, this includes into the solid 2 simplex. That's filled in. Um, an even more special case is if k equals l, then this gives the identity map. Um, right, so that so this recipe for including, if if both sides were filled in, then you'd just be sending every simplex to itself in the sort of most boring way possible. So that's one. Um, uh, and here you see that the, the problem where f was not injective doesn't arise because you know that the simply uh, that the vertices include um, this map f prescribed by inclusions is always going to be injective. But of course, it doesn't have to be. Um, so at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, for arbitrary k, you have a unique simplicial map. to uh, the one-vertex simplicial complex.
um, I guess we've given this a name, haven't we? This is uh, this is uh, delta zero. Uh, this is the solid uh, zero simplex. So what do you do? You just take every simplex of k. That's a list. Of, so every vertex of k rather, and there's only one vertex to send it to. So it'll take anything, you know, whatever your k is. It could be this tetrahedron. Uh, with some things filled and other things not, who cares? Uh, all of this would get sent to a single vertex, and that's a perfectly good simplicial map. So if you're used to uh, graph homomorphisms that are sort of strictly required to send edges to edges, you note that uh, this is not going to be, um, this is not that sort of rigid. It, it, it allows you to squish uh, all sorts of simplices down to things of smaller size. So the warning, I guess, in all of this to keep in mind is that in general, the dimension of the image simplex f of sigma is less than or equal to the dimension of sigma, and equality is not a guarantee. So this dimension is just measuring the failure of injectivity uh, of f when restricted to the vertices of sigma. Okay, great. Um, uh, whenever you have a notion of function, uh, there are two important things that you should uh, check. Uh, and I'll write them out here. Um, the first one is if f goes from k to l is a simplicial map, and g goes from l to m is a simplicial map. then uh, their composite, G composed with F, is a simplicial map from K to M. Which is to say, um, you can compose simplicial maps provided that the target of one uh, is the same as the source of the other. Um, okay, well, what would this composite mean? I mean, you just take a vertex of K, attack it with F, you get a vertex of L, attack it with g, you get a vertex of m, and this process is guaranteed if f and g are simplicial to send simplices of k to simplices of m. And of course, as we've warned, the dimension may drop twice, but that's allowed. Um, okay, and b, now that you can compose and you have a notion of what the identity map is, it's just an inclusion of k into itself, as described above, <coughs> sorry, um, you can define uh, isomorphisms. So call k, sorry, not k, f from k to l an isomorphism if there exists a backward map, simplicial of course, l to k, so that uh, g composed f is the identity on something and f composed g is the identity on something, and let's see, uh, this should be a k and that should be an l, but there's of course a 50% chance that I've screwed it up, so it's your job to make sure uh, that this is the way it should be and not the other way around. Okay, um, the rest of this lecture is just dedicated to understanding what simplicial maps mean from the perspective of the geometric realization, which we saw in the last lecture. Um, so there's good news and there is bad news. So let me tell you the good news first. The good news is, for the most part, um, they, uh, the, the notion of simplicial maps and the notion of uh, geometric realization of simplicial complexes behave quite well with each other. So let me, let me say uh, what I mean by that in the form of a proposition. Um, if f k to l is a simplicial map, what's the best thing you could hope for? Well, the best thing you could hope for is the following. Um, it induces a continuous function uh, from the geometric realization of the source to the geometric realization of the target. Um, and since we've been indicating this geometric stuff with, uh, with these vertical bars like an absolute value, let's just call it, um, you know, that's the continuous map um, on these topological spaces, uh, realization of K and realization of L. 
so that's the best thing you could hope for. It's true. This is correct. This happens. And the other good thing you could hope for is if G from L to N is another simplicial map, then uh, whether you compose the simplicial maps and then induce the continuous map or first induce the continuous maps and then compose them, it doesn't matter. Uh, so this is a nice sort of, it, it warms the cockles of your heart type of result. Uh, so this is going to be the, you know, this is what happens if you compose the simplicial maps first and then pass to the induced continuous map. And this is exactly the same as doing this. So, um, good. Um, instead of trying to prove this, let me just give you, there's, there's just one idea in all of this. Both uh, assertions follow from just one bright idea, which is how should we define, um, how to define uh, this F given uh, the simplicial map. And once you understand this, A and B are, are straightforward. There isn't much to think about or do. You just calculate. So uh, let's see. Um, how did we define geometric realizations? Well, we needed these affine embeddings, right? So uh, to, to send vertices to affine the independent points in some Euclidean space. So let's give ourselves access to just any pair of affine embeddings. So let phi from k0 to rm and psi from L0 to Rn be affine embeddings. Okay, so what that means is that every x in the geometric realization of K is expressible, in fact, it's uniquely expressible as some linear combination uh, over vi, and I'll explain what vi is in a second, of um, ti phi of vi, where vi ranges over the vertices in k naught. So uh, these are just all the vertices that you um, threw into uh, Rn using this map phi. Um, and the sum, the sum of ti equals 1 with each ti greater than or equal to 0, right? Okay, so we need to take this x and spit out its image under f. So this is going to be, let's see, you still want to sum over the same vi. So it's some sum over the vertices of k, not of L. Um, the coefficients ti will remain the same. It's the same sort of linear combination as you had before. Now what you want is realizations of vertices in Rn induced by psi. So this is going to be psi composed with something. And the something is, of course, f of vi. There's only one choice. So if you think about this, uh, what's happening here is vi is a vertex of k, f of vi is a vertex of l, because that's what f is supposed to do. This is that vertex in Rn sent there by phi, and then you take the same linear combination as you were going to do um, in, in, in the realization of k. So this whole thing lives um, by construction in the realization of L uh, with respect to this map psi. But of course, that doesn't matter because any affine independent thing gives you the right answer up to homeomorphism. Okay, great. So we've learned not only does um, uh, can you induce this continuous map, but also uh, look at the right side. The things that appear are only in the image simplex. So if x was in a simplex sigma, then f of x would be in f of sigma, the realization of f of sigma. So this map, f, when restricted, 
to this piece of the domain, to any uh, realization of a sigma, which is a piece of K, maps linearly to the image F of sigma, which is in the realization of L. So these are called piecewise linear maps for this reason. On each piece given by a simplex, these are linear. So if you need something to look up, look up piecewise linear maps or piecewise linear topology, and there's a huge amount of literature on these maps and their properties. They're, they're beautiful precisely because there's, they're defined combinatorially, but they give you these nice uh, geometric, um, you know, concrete pieces that you can visualize and play with. Okay, so um, I said there was good news and bad news, and so this is the end of the good news period where Okay, there's an explicit recipe for getting these maps. They're continuous. They map a simplex to a simplex. Very nice. Um, uh, but here is, um, uh, here is something you have to keep track of because it's a little challenging. Um, so this is, I don't know, the symbol for, um, the lightning symbol for something strange happening. Um, so on the one hand, if f from k to l is an isomorphism, then um, this induced map f, the continuous one from k to l, is a homeomorphism. So this part makes you happy, so happy, but the part that is a bit annoying is that it is possible uh, that the converse is sort of depressingly not true. We can have K homeomorphic without this homeomorphism being realized as f for any simplicial map f from k to l or back from l to k it doesn't matter so uh, because it's a homeomorphism um, um, uh, sorry this, yes k to l or l to k these can be homeomorphic um, but but this homeomorphism cannot be achieved by the class of all continuous maps induced by simplicial maps uh, between K and L. Um, and to see an infinite family of examples, you should read the notes of this course. So there are some notes. Uh, and look at the section on very centric subdivision. This gives a huge family, an infinite family of examples where um, you uh, have isomorphic, uh, sorry, homeomorphic geometric realizations, but no good simplicial maps to achieve it. Okay, that's all. See you next time.